Welcome to GV247.TV, the Global Vision Channel. A non-profit web TV channel bringing biblical perspective to the world in which you live. Hello and welcome to this week's The Weekend Show. And our special guest again is Pastor David Nathan from Bread of Life Ministries in South Africa. And David is um, a man of God who's very, he's very keen to ensure that the body of Christ grows in the correct way. And he la- makes himself available to share the word. And this week we're actually going to be talking about what is church. So, David. Well, what is church? Yeah. Uh, we've got what? Three, four days. Okay. Just an, in a an overview, because you know, David, as we've spoken about earlier, people aren't sure exactly what's required of them. And well, what is church? Well, let's look at it. Mm. What is church? Well, firstly, let's ask the question, what is the church? The church is very simple. It is the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is all those who come to salvation mm-hmm. through the grace of the Lord, who have the Spirit of God indwelling them, all who are washed in the blood of Christ, mm-hmm. We form the church. So the church is not a local organism. The church is made up of local bodies, Mm -hmm. a part of the vineyard. Mm -hmm. But the body as a whole is the church. Now, the church is not something that is stagnant. As as Peter writes in 1 Peter chapter 2, he says, You also as living stones are being built up a spiritual house. Mm -hmm. So the church is made up of those who are born again, those who have been adopted by the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of God in them who gives them the identity as the sons of God or the, the children of God. Mm-hmm. We come together and we are being built up. The church is that part of the body that is influenced by the head that is growing from infancy to maturity. So as Peter says, we're being built up a spiritual house. Now, for the, in order for the church to grow, it requires... Uh, vessels or it, it, it requires probably a better word is it, it, it requires those gifts those servants that God has ordained to feed the sheep mm-hmm. to you know to to mm-hmm. cause this, the growth of the body so right uh, in in the beginning of the church where where the Lord uh, calls Peter aside and he says I want you to feed my sheep I want you to tend my sheep I want you to look after my people the idea is that just as a flock of sheep requires shepherd so the body of christ requires shepherds and they have a very very clear mandate from god and the mandate that the shepherds have we find in um, in, in paul's letter to the ephesians in chapter 4 where he says from verse 11 he says that the lord has appointed five officers in the church so he says in ephesians 4:11 he himself, speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ, gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So what is the church? The church is made up of blood-washed, born-again believers in Jesus Christ. They are in the process of growing. They are being discipled, the Great Commission. Jesus gave his apostles a instruction, go and make disciples. Mm-hmm. At no point did he say, go make converts, which is what the church is doing. Yeah. We're making converts. We believe that our mandate mm-hmm. is to bring people to the cross. And once they're saved, mm-hmm. well, we've now fulfilled our, our, our bit here. Yeah. The truth of the matter is the commission only begins once somebody is saved. You can't disciple an unbeliever. Mm -hmm. And so what Paul is saying is that God has given these five officers to act as an oversight. They're not the super saints. They're not better Christians than anyone else. Mm -hmm. But they have been given an authority and a grace by God to equip the saints to do the work of the ministry. Mm -hmm. So let's just summarize what I've said so far. The church is made up of believers Mm -hmm. under the headship of Jesus Christ. The commission that God gave his church was to go make disciples. Make disciples by teaching them Mm -hmm. to observe the things that Christ had taught. So a disciple is one who's under instruction. 
So if we are in church, if we are a Christian, a Bible-believing Christian, and we are in a church, then we are under instruction, which means that the churches must then be geared up to make disciples. Now here is where, by and large, the church has failed dismally. We do not, and most of the churches that I'm aware of, do not have a systematic biblical discipleship tract. And that's why I'm incredibly grateful to, to yourself and Stuart for the Lamplight Project and for resources mm. like that where a baby Christian, a newborn, can systematically be taught. Yeah. And every church, if they are going to be a biblical church, must have, and I'm, I'm going to use the word purposeful mm -hmm. very carefully. Yes. Yes. All right. But it must be purposeful. Yeah. Yeah. You don't you don't you don't begin a project without having a very clear goal in mind. That's right. When the Lord birthed the church, he had a very clear goal in mind. Mm -hmm. As he is, so are we in this world. We are to begin over time to reflect the nation of Christ. We need to become more Christ-like. Christ is coming back for a church that is holy, blameless, and without reproach, as Paul says in Colossians chapter 1. So discipleship needs to be purposeful. We start with a baby, an infant, who knows nothing except Jesus loves me, God the Father loves me, God is good, and they are like a sponge. Yeah. All they want to do is they want to know about this God who has saved them, who has mm -hmm. transformed their lives. They are ripe for instruction. Yeah. Well, now they've got to know about, well, a little bit more about salvation. Mm -hmm. right? Repents from dead works. It's not about working for your salvation anymore. Faith toward God, this, this journey that you've now begun, mm -hmm. is a journey of faith, from faith to faith. Yeah. The just, as Habakkuk says, shall live by his faith. Without faith, the writer of Hebrews says, it is impossible to please God. So we need to teach them on faith. But then the Bible talks about the doctrine of baptisms. Mm -hmm. We need to, talk to teach them about water baptism mm -hmm. and help them through water baptism. And there's the baptism of the Holy Spirit. There's the doctrine of the laying on of hands, the gifts of the Spirit and how they, what are they, how they function. Mm -hmm. There's the doctrine of the resurrection of the dead. Mm. Very important. Imperative. That's what Christianity is all about. Isn't, isn't that it? our hope? <laughs> it's, our bliss. it's wonderful. It's wonderful. That's right. As Paul says, yeah. if there's no resurrection, we might as well eat and drink and be merry. And he <laughs> says, we all will be day. That's yeah. right. He says, if we don't believe in the resurrection, he says, we of all people yeah. are the most pitiable. Yeah. And as you, as you know, as 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 you as you're implying, you know, mm -hmm. the knowledge in the church about the resurrection of the dead is appalling. Yeah. The number of times I get. Uh, questions by, by email uh, what happens to me when I die and it's fundamental part of Christianity Basically. fundamental part of Christianity absolutely teaching. correct and you have mature believers well, sorry let me re rephrase that okay. you have believers who have been in the Lord mm -hmm. decades mm -hmm. asking these questions yeah. and then he, the final doctrine which was which comprises the elementary the milk mm -hmm. of the word mm -hmm is the of eternal judgment mm -hmm. is there a legitimate sorry is there a real hell mm -hmm. is it eternal hell is heaven for real these are the basics and you know what is, what is so amazing mm -hmm. the writer of hebrews in chapters uh, the end of chapter 5 and chapter 6 verse 1 and 2 he lays out these six foundation principles and he calls them the milk of the word he mm -hmm. says this is the elementary stuff Basic, yeah. yeah he says we we need to go past this mm -hmm. so we can become mature mm -hmm. That he wrote in the first century. Yeah. It's two millennia later, and the Christian church cannot agree on the six foundation principles. And we wonder why we're in a mess. Mm -hmm. So what is the church? In theory, mm -hmm. we are living stones mm -hmm. who are growing mm -hmm. together mm -hmm. to offer praises to him mm -hmm. who has redeemed us out of darkness into his glorious life and to sing forth his praises so we should be under instruction god has given us these gifts in the church mm -hmm. to equip us to train us to edify us to pro to, to protect the mm -hmm. church from false doctrine yes. from false brethren until we all come to the knowledge of the truth so there needs to be or there was in in the in the heart of god an understanding that his church will come to unity 
I thank God that we serve an almighty God. I thank God that nothing is impossible because when I look at the church today, I wonder how he's going to do it. But God will. He will unite his church under one doctrine, Mm -hmm. in one spirit, under one Lord. So this thing called the church, this organism, is blood-washed believers Mm. who are being looked after, cared for by, Mm -hmm. by elders, growing to reflect Jesus Christ under instruction, and as they grow, so they in turn take their place yeah. within the church. And this is so important. Mm-hmm. Each one of us have a place and a role to play in the church of Jesus Christ. We're living stones. It's, yeah, exactly. Absolutely. And we have been given gifts. Every single one of us, there is no exception, has something to contribute. And I love what Paul writes in Ephesians 16. He says, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what Every joint supplies. You say, well, David, I'm not a joint. Probably not, and thank God. Mm. According to the effect of working by which every part does its share. Mm. Well, you might not be a joint. But you're a part. But you're a part. (laughs) Which means none of us can say, well, I don't have a role to play. So the church is made up of living stones, Mm. each doing their part, which causes growth of the body, Mm -hmm. of the edifying of itself in love. Mm -hmm. So church should be this vibrant, alive uh, organism, Mm -hmm. people in love with the Lord, under instruction, growing, participating, Mm -hmm. protected. Church should be glorious and infused Mm -hmm. with the Spirit of God and His presence and His leading. That's biblical church. And... The, you know, that's what we try to practice here. We're just a small, small church and nobody has it right. I know that. But um, that's quite an important question. When can a church get too big? A church is too big when individuals are no, are no longer cared for. Mm-hmm. So when you yes. can't get around to really loving and caring mm. uh, and, and building up people, yeah. your church is too big. Mm-hmm. So either you need to raise up leaders mm-hmm. or you need to maybe split uh, according to locale. Just quickly, David, um, what's happening nowadays, as you know, well, we've set up this online church called the Sheepfold.Church, which is, um, needs a lot of work done to it because, you know, we need, we need the people Mm. who will help to lead it, but it's there for um, sheep to come into, to have some form of fellowship and the teaching and so on. But, What about conferences? What happens when you then get groups of people going to, and sometimes they follow a teacher, they follow maybe one or two particular teachers and it's, they quote them rather than the Bible. We've been hearing this for so long now. So-and-so says, so-and-so. David, is there there a place for that or what do you think? The Lord has ordained the church Mm -hmm. to be his vehicle and his vessel to make disciples. Anything parachurch that is not in submission to the local church, that's not working with a local church, is destructive. Yeah. Now, what you mentioned, it's, you, you know, uh, Deborah, as you well know, that I've, we've only known each other now for, what, it's about three years? Well, it's about, more, a bit more, than, maybe about, whatever, three or four years. Though. But um, up until, until four years ago, mm-hmm. I was just a local pastor. We planted um, a couple of churches in, in South Africa. But not really au fait with what was going on in the rest of the world. But since I started traveling, I've, ex- I've experienced what, um, what you're talking about is you have man followers. Yeah. Now, I'm not saying that folk on the confer- that speaking conferences don't have that heart. Mm-hmm. But they're not pointing to people, they're not pointing people to church. Yeah. And they're allowing folk mm-hmm. to follow them from conference to conference. I was at a church last weekend where uh, folk, I'm, I don't want to make, give too many details, and mm-hmm. to, to, I don't want to expose anybody, mm-hmm. but folk had been to listen to one teacher mm-hmm. in the morning mm-hmm. and had traveled mm-hmm. literally across London yeah. to listen to me that evening mm-hmm. because that's what they do. They listen to their favorite teachers. How on earth are you going to be discipled? The Bible says that we are to be in submission one to another. None of us are outside of submission. So when you are a loose cannon going from conference to conference, who you're accountable for, who's speaking to your life, who's praying for you, who's discipling you. And that's where error comes in and, and confusion and every wicked thing. So is there a place for conference? Yes. If it's within the, 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 the framework of, of, of a church or, or a group of local churches mm-hmm. and 
folk that that would let's say folk come to salvation in those ch- in in that environment, then they are then placed into mm-hmm. sound churches. Mm-hmm. So there's a place for conferences, but never outside of church, mm-hmm. and never at the expense of church. Yeah. It is not a substitute ever. Mm-hmm. Folks, in case you don't know, the Lamplight Project that David mentioned, um, you can get details by writing into us. There's a website, thelamplightproject.tv, and now we are doing on channel two of this network. We're doing, um, we're doing it as a group where you can join in online. Discipleship is so important. Next week we'll be back, um, and we're going to be talking about Christians and politics. But we'll end by going over to Stuart speaking um, on the discipleship checklist, and he's talking about love, forgiveness, and judgment. Wow, it'll be a good one. Bye bye. God bless. This series is for any Christian believer who is either at the very beginning of their journey with Jesus Christ, or who has been a believer for some years but lacks a sound understanding of the Christian faith. It should also prove to be a helpful aid which interlinks with all our resources for shepherds, overseers, and believers reaching out to others. Love. God is love, 1 John 4, 8. And so therefore, love is the very foundation of the Christian gospel message and needs to be at the heart of every follower of Christ. It's important not to confuse worldly human emotion with the love of the creator of the universe. The Bible teaches that God's love is perfect. It's without flaw. There are no grey areas of compromise and it's completely and wholly just and true. Numbers 23, 19. It's because of this perfection that we can trust God. Yet we must understand that where there is perfect love, there is perfect judgment. The Bible teaches that mankind broke the law of the cosmos and the law demanded the removal of Adam and Eve from the Garden of Eden and death. Genesis 3, 23-24 Yet God so loved us, he sent his Son to rescue us. John three sixteen, Taking our punishment upon himself. 1 Peter two twenty four. When a person comes to Christ, having their sentence of death cancelled, Colossians 2.14, and given the hope of eternal life within a new creation, we are obligated to find out what is required of us. Ephesians 5.10 The body of Christ, being part of a church, a gathering of believers, is not always easy. We may find different characters from a wide range of backgrounds and cultures with diverse views and opinions. New believers often come with heavy baggage on their backs and others still have been wounded very badly within other spiritual environments. The role of leadership is to help every member in their journey with Christ, training them in righteousness, for love is patient and kind, it's long-suffering, it always perseveres and it always hopes. 1 Corinthians 13, 1-13. The greatest act of love is to lay down your life for another, John 15, 12 through to 13. While this is often understood as the penultimate act of giving, a life for a life, we can also understand this from the everyday act of selflessness, where you put someone else before yourself, Philippians 2, 3. Acts of selflessness should, where possible, be done quietly and should not be shouted from the rooftops for all to see your good works. Matthew 6, 1 through to 4. The Lord's servants must learn to serve, and Jesus Christ gave a beautiful example of service to his disciples when he washed their feet. John 13, 1 through to 17. Teaching them that they must do likewise. Now, off note is where Peter refused to be washed, as he clearly felt uncomfortable at his master, the Lord, washing his feet. In this example, we see both the blessing of serving and of receiving, yet we must learn to both give and receive, or we can have no part of Christ's body. John 13, 8 through to 9. Love is obedient, John 14, 15. To love God is to obey his instruction, It's that simple. If you are obedient, you love. If you do not obey, you do not love. 1 John 4, 16 through to 21. To love your brethren is the same as loving God. If you do not love your brethren, you are self-deceived and you do not love God. 1 John 3, 14 through to 15. 
Is loving others easy? Some people are indeed easy to love, while others can be demanding. Yet there is no distinction in love. The Lord makes this clear in Luke 6, 32 through to 36, where he explains that there is little reward in loving those who love you. The world does that. But the greater reward in loving those who do not love you, who are a challenge, that is true love. In regard to love for an enemy, Matthew 5, 43 through to 48, Jesus Christ prayed for those who unwittingly sent him to the cross, Luke 23, 34. Unbelievers are blinded by the God of this world, Satan, 2 Corinthians 4, 4. It is the role of the ambassador of Christ to show them the way, not to condemn them. For Christ did not come to condemn, but to save, John 3:17. The New Testament is packed full of exhortations where disciples of Christ are to love each other deeply, 1 Peter 4, 8. Helping each other to run the race, Hebrews 12, 1 to 2. Helping each other to stand firm, for without love we are nothing more than a clanging gong, 1 Corinthians 13, 1 through to 3. Forgiveness, Matthew 6, 12 through to 15. Every believer misses the mark every day despite our best efforts. Romans 7, 18 through to 25. The Lord's Prayer teaches us to ask the Lord for forgiveness for our shortcomings. Matthew 6, 14. And the Apostle John tells us to confess that we may find forgiveness. 1 John 1, 8 through to 10. This is very important when we come to partake in the Lord's Supper, as a wrong attitude will bring judgment on an individual. 1 Corinthians 11, 27 through to 32. Forgiveness is to be given, for without forgiveness we face judgment. Matthew 6, 12 through to 15. Instruction on how to go about reconciliation and the need to forgive a brother or sister. 70 times 7 can be understood from Matthew 18, 22 through to 35. Unforgiveness and misguided judgmental acts are sadly an everyday occurrence within the church, and you must never be a part of that. Where a believer has an issue with another believer, the scriptures are clear, you need to put it right or you are in danger of being disqualified yourself. 1 Corinthians 9, 27. Unforgiveness leads to a bitter spirit, which can be seen within an individual as being critical towards others. However, it's important not to be confused with a critical examination of sound doctrine, which is imperative for the healthy building up of the church, Titus 1, 9 and 2 Timothy 4, 3. A critical spirit is often seen outworking where a person talks about others behind their back. They will often misquote others in a bid to sensationalise their story. They are busybodies, usually quite lazy. They are slanderers and gossips and are completely untrustworthy. Scripture is clear that God hates this kind of spirit. Proverbs 6, 16 through to 19. And Scripture instructs how to deal with individuals like this in the hope that they will repent and walk upright before the Lord. 2 Thessalonians 3, 6 through to 15. Now, difficulties will arise between believers, but love, and this is a command, demands that whatever the issue, it is to be dealt with correctly. Where two believers are unable to reach an agreement, then an arbitrator will need to aid the meeting. Matthew 18, 15 through to 17. Where a person is unwilling to resolve whatever the issue is, they need to be removed from the church until there is a resolution. 1 Corinthians 5, 9 through to 13. Judgment. Hebrews 10, 26 through to 27. God is perfection and there are no shades of grey. If we walk in the counsel of God's instruction, there is freedom and a wonderful expectation of things to come. Matthew 25, 21. But if we rebel, fearful judgment awaits. Matthew 7, 21 through to 23. Judging. The difference between to condemn or pass sentence and making a right decision. When we cross the road, we need to judge whether it's safe to do so. At the supermarket, we may make judgments regarding food we purchase in regard to health benefits. 
Making decisions is part of everyday life, and for the Christian, our spiritual life needs to be based in the Lord's instruction. Psalm 119, 105. So what does the Bible say? In Matthew 7, 1-3, we read an example where the word to judge means do not condemn or do not pass sentence or you will be judged by the measure you have condemned or you have passed sentence. In this passage of scripture, we must understand that we must never pass sentence or condemn another believer. God alone is the final judge. The scriptures are clear in regard to judging brethren. Romans 14, 4. However, where a decision is required, it is imperative to make a right judgment. To do this, first remove any obstacle from your own life, Matthew 7, 3 to 5, before you attempt to address someone else's actions. Where separating truth from error is required, 2 Timothy 2, 15, sound doctrine will be the bedrock for making the correct judgment, 1 Corinthians 6, 1 through to 6. To conclude, the mature disciple of Christ must be able to make a right decision in line with God's holy, unchangeable instruction, for all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. 2 Timothy 3.16-17 Next week, we look at warnings in the Bible to the believer. God bless. This is GV247.TV, bringing biblical perspective to the world in which you live. A powerful free resource with hundreds of short films on a wide range of Bible topics from experts around the world plus full-length sermons and programs for teaching and encouragement. Choose from current affairs, signs of the times, a chance to voice your own opinion, and special offers on our full-length feature films, documentaries and study materials. At over four hours in length, The Lamplight Project is a systematic 12-part Bible study series, a powerful teaching tool that begins with the origins of life and takes the viewer on a comprehensive journey packed with high-profile interviews, film, graphics and illustrations, concluding with the return of Christ and an encouragement to stand firm and be faithful. Complete with a free study guide download for both personal and group study, this powerful interactive guide connects to over a thousand programs with expert interviews on gv247.tv our free service web TV channel. Does My Life Have Meaning? A powerful one-hour presentation produced from the Lamplight Project. With a free copy of the Gospel of Luke, this film is crammed with engaging interviews, film and graphics. A life-challenging film to those searching for answers. As distributors for the Jesus film, we offer this timeless movie based on Luke's Gospel. This clear presentation of the life of Jesus Christ has been viewed worldwide and translated into over 1,200 languages. We provide the film with a free copy of the Gospel of Luke. The Daniel Project is a popular TV documentary that presents an overview of Bible prophecy and an encouragement to read the signs of the times. Hailed as one of the best TV films to be made on the subject, DVD extras feature a heart-to-heart -heart interview about the way of rescue. Based loosely on the documentary, The Daniel Connection is a full-length feature film. This fictional thriller incorporates many of the themes promoted through pop culture and social media which affect people on a global scale. Launched at the Cannes Film Festival, The Daniel Connection points the ever-skeptical viewer to search the Bible for answers to life's deepest questions. We've been serving the body of Christ for over 30 years, and if you would like further information, please do not hesitate to get in touch. <laughs>